Good morning, church. Okay. How are you? Amen. Amen. Oh, I won't lie. Playing the guitar in front of you always makes me more nervous than anything else. <laughs> Praise the Lord for a way of humbling me. One of many ways. But we have been discussing several things here um, in regarding to end time events. We've looked at the mark of the beast and the seal of God there in Revelation 13. And actually, and actually Revelation 13 tells us, tells us that there's going to be two groups. Two groups. Those that are sealed and those that are marked. If you, go, if you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1. I'm sorry. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. Revelation chapter 7. There it talks about the sealing of God verse 7. Chapter 7 verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with the voice of the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. And what was he saying? Do not harm the earth the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Is God done sealing his people? No. We know that because here the angels are still sealing and actually the, you know, God says, just wait. Hold. Telling the angels, just, just hold on just a little bit longer because there are more people to save that can be saved. And the angels are just waiting for the command to release the, the winds, to release what God has. So praise the Lord that the sealing is not done. He is still working. He is still working. Now then, if the sealing is not done, God is still sealing. And we, we, we looked at uh, there, now we can turn to Revelation chapter 13. We've looked at the mark of the beast and the seal of God. So if God is not done sealing, do people today then have the mark of the beast? No. no. There we see a Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. Revelation 13, verse 12. Here we see that the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, and he exercises awe. This is talking about the second beast which we've already looked at and studied in previous sermons, who, have, who is described as the United States of America, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes. That's an important word. He causes, he forces. If I cause you to do something, you have no choice, right? I'm making you, I'm forcing you and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Verse 15, And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak and cause, again, there it is, and cause as many as will not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Verse 16, And he causes, how many? All. Everybody, okay, that's important. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and and slave everybody to receive a mark on the right hand 
or on their forehead. The reason why we know that no one today has the mark of the beast is because the mark of the beast has to be enforced for someone to receive it. For someone to receive it. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, everyone, to receive the mark. He causes it. And we've already reviewed in previous studies as well of what is the mark of the beast. And we're going to look at it uh, early in a, from a couple of quotes. But just for those who have been here and if you have missed it, I invite you to go to our website and you can listen to our, our sermons there. So what is the mark of the beast? It's the mark of the beast. We, we've identified who the beast is, which is the papal system. Notice I said that the papal system, not papacy people, the papal system. So what is their mark, their identity mark? And their identity mark is Sunday changing from Sabbath to Sunday. So the mark of the beast is Sunday observance. And I say that with all love and kindness, but it, it's what the Bible in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 have revealed to us. And so, if that is the mark of the beast, but is anyone forcing anyone today to observe Sunday? No. no. Not yet. So meanwhile, it is not forced. We cannot say somebody, so-and-so, has the mark of the beast. And we can't ju just hang in there. We'll, we'll, we will know why. Because during, during the time that it will be enforced, many will go to scriptures and come out of those systems. And if they come out of those systems, we can say they already have the mark of the beast. So, so praise the Lord that God is still sealing his people. The mark of the beast is not... No, no one has the mark of the beast because it is not being enforced yet. And I want to share with you from five uh, testimony to the church, volume 5, page 464. It says, it is now, no, no, I'm sorry, it is no time now for God's people to be fixed there, to be fixing their affections or laying up their treasures in the world. The time is not far distant when like early disciples we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians. Does anyone remember or know when Jerusalem got destroyed in 70 AD that no Christian died? No Christian died. You can, this, this is basic history. If you look at how when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they first surrounded the city and they stayed, then they left. And for the Christians, that was a sign. Destruction is coming. And they left. So the next time the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem, not one Christian died. So here, we are told as the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans armies was the signal for, for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumptions of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath. What's another word for the papal Sabbath? Sunday. It's Sunday. Enforcing the papal Sabbath. Is it being enforced right now? No. But that will be a signal uh, when the decree enforcing the papal Sunday will be a warning to us, it will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. Among the mountains. You see, when, the, when this is enforced, if you remember, uh, the last message I talked about no buy, no sell, no problem. Because when, you, when it, it is enforced, there in Revelation 13, verse 17, there will be some people in Cleburne, Texas, who will not 
receive the mark of the beast. Amen. 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 I thought that would be you. And here it says that in verse uh, you know, 16 that it will cause all to receive the mark of the beast. In verse 17, and that no one may buy or sell except those who have the mark who have the name of the beast or the number of his name. You see, it won't be any good to be still hanging around and living in the cities if you can't buy or sell. It's time, once that decree is set and it is law, it is time to leave. It is time to leave. So, should we leave the cities now? That is a decision between you and God between you and God. If you feel that now is the time to leave because of the influences of the city, that's between you and God and leave. But we are told that once this decree happens, that is the warning. That is the warning to not hang around bigger cities or medium, any kinds of cities. You see, if you do decide to leave the cities, God bless you, and that's fine. But do not think that that is an excuse still not to work and win souls for Jesus. Because the time of probation has not closed yet. If you want to be out in the country, good for you, but we all still have a mission into bringing souls to the cross and to repentance. So whether it's, whether it's time to leave the cities, that's up to you right now. But we are told that when that decree is enforced, the papal Sabbath will be a warning for us. It will then, then be time to leave the cities. And, we, and you know, we won't be able to buy or sell. We will depend on God to supply our needs. So this morning, what I want to share with you, what I want to talk to you, is just about their of our scripture reading of God's judgment of the seven last plagues. Seven last plagues. What is your reaction when you hear about the seven last plagues? Or maybe you may read, you know, you may see books there and in Christian bookstores, the seven last plagues. Does that, does it bring fear to you? Anxiety? Nervousness? Do you think maybe you know, God is abandoning you or going to abandon the people during the seven last plagues? What is your reaction? How does, how does God deal with his people during the time of trouble? Well, did God forget faithful Noah when he flooded the earth? Did he? No. God didn't forget faithful Noah when he flooded the earth. Did God forget Joseph when he was in Egypt? No. Did God forget Elijah while Jezebel was out trying to kill him? No. How about Jeremiah when he was placed in that pit wanting to die? God did not forget Jeremiah. Or did God even forget or ignore Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego, or Daniel in Babylon? No, he didn't. But what about those who didn't make it? Did God intervene in the beheading of John the Baptist? Did he forget John the Baptist? Did God intervene from Stephen being stoned? No. Did he forget Stephen? Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. God does not forget his people. Although we might not see a visible deliverance, God will never forget his people. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15. Isaiah 49, verse 15. Here the Bible says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? You know, our first reaction is like, well, of course not. But we live in a world where that does happen. We live in a world where people do abandon their child. 
praise the Lord, there are, there are people, others, willing to accept and raise that child. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. Here Jesus is saying, I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. There is nothing we can do that God will not forget us. I like Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8 where he says, He who touches you touches the apple of my eye. God knows every single pain that people go to, every suffering that people go to, every joy. Nothing gets by him. Nothing gets by him. You know, once in a while people ask me, how did your day go? Did you have a good week? And sometimes I even ask the similar questions. Just today as I greet some people, how was your week? And some people were like, oh, they may not have had a good week. You know, sometimes when we pray, can you imagine asking God, Lord, how was your week? How was your day? And you know, I can imagine God, if we could hear his voice saying, well, I was with children today who, who were starving and I saw them as they breathed their last breath from no food. I was with a mother who lost her child today. I was with those people who were in, in, in the classroom and someone came in and shot them and it hurt me as they cried out to me. I was right there. God hears every single thing and sees every single thing. Those who touch us touches the apple of his eye. Nothing gets by God. The Bible even tells us that our tears, that he catches our tears and saves them in a bottle. God does not forget us, friends. Whether he delivers us like Noah or he lets us go to sleep like John the Baptist, God does not forget us. And to understand the, the seven last plagues, because sometimes if we talk about plagues, we think that, oh, God is abandoning us. We're going to be in a time with no mediator, as if we're going to be alone. Friends, the Bible there, God, Jesus himself tells us that I will be with you till the end of time, till the end of the world. As you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I invite you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it's important that before we look at the last plagues, we consider the first plagues. We're looking at the, at the seven last plagues. And by the way, this is part one of the message. There is no way I could have fit this in 30 minutes. So next week we will continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1. We need to consider the first plagues before we even consider the last plagues. That just makes sense. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and ate the spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Who is it talking about? Who are these people? Who drank from the rock? And who followed them with the cloud? It's Israel, right? The children of Israel when they left Egypt. Verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. For these things, because... No, now these things became our what? Example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Huh? It's interesting. You see, the last plague, we need to study the first plague because they're an example for us. What happened to Israel here, Paul is telling us that these things are an example for us that we should not lust after things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. 
as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up and play. Verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition on whom the end of the age has come. It's important that we, that, that, that we tie that together and look at the first plagues as we continue to look at the last plagues. And that's why I hear great controversy, page 627 says, The plagues upon Egypt, when God was about to deliver Israel, were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgment which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. Okay, so, so it, we need to look at the first plagues before we continue and looking at the last plagues. So there are some similarities actually between the first plagues and the last plagues. How many plagues were in the first plagues? Ten plagues. And in the last there are seven plagues. Both sets of plagues are brought by God. Are brought by God. Who brought the judgment on Egypt with the plagues? It was God. The, it wasn't the devil bringing the plagues. God brought the plagues. And in the end, God will bring the seven last plagues. Both sets of plagues are set are, are set out by the power of God. Both sets of plagues come before deliverance. And we're going we're gonna to hone in more on, on, more on that. Both sets of plagues come before deliverance. That's important. We have to go through a time of trouble before we are delivered. Both sets of plagues are punishment on the wicked. And both sets of plagues are a trial to the righteous. Are a trial to the righteous. See, God with, with the plagues, the ten plagues and even the seven last plagues, is dealing both with the wicked and with the righteous. Because during the plagues, God is not going to deliver you until He afflicts you. You may think, hmm, that's kind of, I don't know about that. We're going to see here in a little bit. God does not deliver you until He afflicts you. Affliction is part of deliverance. Affliction is part of deliverance. The darkest hour is right before dawn, right before sunlight. And the affliction is part of our deliverance. That's why 2 Timothy, open your Bible, is there. 2 Timothy tells us. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 It says yes and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution You will suffer if you want to desire to live godly If you want to just fake it and just be a Christian by name but not be a sincere real Christian you won't suffer because the, the, the devil knows. The devil knows who are real Christians and who aren't real Christians. The devil knows what we do and what we don't do. And he, he knows who are the fakes. And he has those in his pocket, so he doesn't worry about those. Until they start changing and being converted and following the right will of God, then he begins to persecute them because he wants them where? back in the little pocket controlling them like he controls the rest so here yes and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution you remember even Jesus in, in Matthew 24 where he tells us that they will hate you for for my name's sake and they will persecute you for my name's sake there in the signs of the end 
Revelation chapter 15, part of our scripture reading there. Revelation chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. We are afflicted first, and then comes the deliverance. There it says, And after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with gold bands. Then one of the living four creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke and the glory of God from and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed did anyone get to sneak into heaven before the seven last plagues no one no one was able to enter you know this also debunks the idea of the secret rapture because the whole theology of the secret rapture is that God raptures his people before tribulation so you don't got to go through hard times. But here the Bible is clear that no one goes into the temple until the seven last plagues are completed. Are completed. How about Daniel chapter 12? Daniel chapter 12. Here... Daniel chapter 12 tells us that there will be a time of trouble such as never has seen before. That means it's even going to be worse than the ten plagues of Egypt. Daniel chapter 12. Timothy tells us that all of us who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. And that persecution, don't think it's only from the outside. Sometimes it's internal persecution. Even among families, there is persecution. Revelation 15, no one will sneak into heaven before the plagues. And Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. You know, if we, for, if we look at history, sometimes we, we look at some historical events and think, man, that must have been a, a hard time of trouble. But here, the Bible is predicting such a time of trouble that there has never ever been such as never was since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people shall what shall be delivered now in the order of the text what comes first the time of trouble and then deliverance or deliverance and then time of trouble the time of trouble comes first and then God delivers and then God delivers God knows you see God knows friends that you and I can stand that we can stand because were you born to be lost absolutely not don't let anyone ever tell you or deceive you or lie to you that God has chosen some to be lost and some to be saved. Everyone that is born, God chooses and is willing to be saved. No one was born to be lost. And, and because of that, God knows that you are able to stand in the time of trouble. You see, God knew I was going to be born during this time, 1975, October. He knew I was going to be born. He knows if I'm going to be alive during the time of trouble. And because he knew that, he has still allowed me to be born. And you and I to be born. And our children to be born. Because he knows that we can stand in the midst of trouble. If you are born in these last days, God knows that he can count on you to hang in there. And you know, and you know how he, he knows that? Look at, look at Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Praise the Lord. 
God knew if we would be alive during the time of trouble that we could make it. And the only way we can make it because He knows that we will be dependent on Him. Exodus chapter 15 verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song and He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise Him. The Lord is our salvation. Psalms 18. Psalms chapter 18. The reason why we can stand friends is because we depend on God. Don't think you can stand on your own. Psalms chapter 18 verse 32. Oops. These are promises of God that tells us it is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. Who gives us the strength? God. Who will give us the strength to stand in, in the last days in the time of trouble? God, God will. Psalms 91. Psalms 91. One of my first psalms to memorize verse 11 but Psalms 91 it would be well including myself if the entire of Psalm 91 we had it memorized Psalms 91 verse 7 a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not come near you only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because why? Because you're so strong? No. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. Amen. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Then shall they shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your feet against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because, here it is, here's the, it's the condition. Because he has set his love upon me. Now, when you read this, you know, it's he is you and I. Not God looking, he has said, no, no. We have set our love upon him. This, this, this is God talking. Because he has set his love upon me. Amen. Therefore, I will what? Deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He knows my name. Friends, God knows that we can make it through because we depend on him because we depend on him Isaiah chapter 41 turn to Isaiah chapter 41 Isaiah chapter 41 Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 the Bible says here it says fear not Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not, why? Because God will be with us. But in order for this to happen, friends, we must depend on God and spend time with Him. You see, God must think, God must think that people in the last days, you and I, if we're going to make it through, He must think that we're going to pray more. He must think then that we're going to worship more. We're going to come to church more. We're going to come to prayer meeting more. We're going to forgive more. We're going to spend more time in His Word. If God is going to let us go through these plagues, then he believes that we are going to be, that we are going to be deeper and stronger in, in our faith. That's the only way we can make it. There is no other way we can make it on our own. 
And if you and I are alive during this time, He is depending on us to study more, pray more, read more, forgive more, serve more. That it will be the only way we will be able to make it through. Being fully more dependent on God. God has confidence that there will be people here that just don't complain anymore. And they just trust God. They just trust God. You see, God is in the, in the work of polishing, of refining us. And if there is something that needs to come out of our character, something that needs to come out of us, God will drill it and drill it until it's out. So in these moments of your life, when you don't understand what is going on, what God is doing, hold on to Him because He is strengthening your faith. Continue to depend on Him. Even though you may not see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know there is a light. I can imagine there John the Baptist. That's one of my favorite stories to read. Not because of the situation that happened, but because John depended solely on God. There was, uh, there was a time where John sent message, is this the Messiah? And there was a little time where he was like, am I following the right? I mean, is, maybe should we be looking for somebody else? You, re you, you remember that story? And Jesus sends back messages to John the Baptist and those messages strengthen him. And John probably thought any time probably my cousin is going to come and take me out or Herod will release me. But there came a day when the soldier came and took him out. And maybe John thought this is it. This is the day. Okay, Herod is, is going to let me go. But instead of letting him out to the wilderness that John was accustomed to, he sent them to the execution room, lay his head down, and what? Take out a sword there. Can you imagine John's thoughts? Can you imagine John's thoughts as his head was laying there before his head got chopped off? Do you think he thought, what? Why am I dying? And he was blood related to Jesus. But yet he depended on God. Just like Stephen, as he was being stoned, what did he say? Forgive. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And he beheld the heavens and saw God, saw Jesus there. So even though in moments of your life when you don't understand what God is doing, hold on to him, friends. Because God is strengthening, polishing your faith. He's taking out He's taking out things that will be in the way when the time of trouble comes. Revelation 14, if you join me there, one thing that we need to, we need to cover and I need to mention is that the last plagues will bring the close of probation. Revelation chapter 14, 14 verse 9. We've seen that there are similarities between the plagues, both with, with the Egyptian plagues and the last plagues. And God is dealing both with the wicked and the saints during the plagues. But there in Revelation chapter 14, these last plagues will bring the close of probation. To whom do the, to, to whom do the last plagues fall upon? Do they fall upon everybody? On the wicked. And more specific here, the Bible tells us, Revelation 14, verse 9. Revelation 14, verse 9, it says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself, 
shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So there, these plagues are being poured out to those who have the mark of the beast, the mark or the image of the beast. Revelation chapter 16. You're there in 14, just turn to chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. It tells us again on who the plagues fall. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, okay, these, these angels are ready. Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men whom had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image. So who receives the seven last plagues? Those who have the mark of the beast. Do you see why also, again, no one today has the mark of the beast? So here these seven last plagues are poured out to those who have the mark of the beast. And once the plagues are poured out, Once the plagues are poured out, can that person repent? No. And then God take out the plague? It will be too late, friends. It will be too late. Because Revelation 22, 11 will be fulfilled. When the seven last plagues begin, when the seven last plagues begin, Revelation 22, Verse 11 will be fulfilled. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. You know, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be, what? When the Son of Man comes. And in the days of Noah, who closed the ark door? It only had one door. God did. There, Genesis chapter 7, the Bible says that God shut him in. So, all that time, the door was open. Noah never closed it. The animals came in. The sons came in. The daughter-in-laws came in. His wife came in. And he opened it for everyone else to come in. Did anyone else come in? But there came a time where God says, get inside. And he shut that door. And when God closed that door, could Noah open it? No. I, I, I really encourage you to read Patriarchs and Prophets there on the flood story where Noah tried to open it because he could hear people crying outside. Let me in. And he cried and his heart was broken because he wanted them to be saved. But did they have their chance to be saved? Yes, they did. And the point that I am making is that there will come a time where grace is done. Grace is done. Friends, that's why, praise the Lord, right now, God is still sealing his people. The grace, the doors of grace are wide open. Amen. They're more open today than ever before. If there's ever a time to come to God, it's now. Amen. Because once the door of probation closes, it will be too late. There's a, there's, there's a reason why Jesus says it will be gnashing and wailing of teeth. He wasn't just using... You know, oh, let me see. What can I say how it will be? It's, it's, we have no idea on how it terrible it will be. The seven last plagues bring the close of probation and mercy will be no more. Great Controversy, page 428. Here it says, when the world 
when the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then, and not till then, probation will close and the door of mercy will be shut. Then, not till then. We can't say, oh, it's already closed now. No. And then it will be shut. I want to appeal to you, and in this appeal, I want you to imagine, let's pretend that this platform here is a timeline, okay, of, of history. And here in the piano side is the National Sunday Law, the Papal Sabbath that is enforced. You, re you remember that, how, right? When, when we looked at that in Revelation, Revelation 13, that it will enforce. So let's, let's pretend that the piano here is the time of history where it's enforced. And you fast forward through time, and let's pretend that this pulpit here is when the seven last plagues begin, okay? And you continue in time and let's, let's pretend and assume that this organ is the second coming of Jesus. All right, so are you with me so far? Yes. What's the piano? The National Sunday Law, where Revelation 13 is enforced, right? And then here in the middle, the seven last plagues, God says God gets up from the most holy place, steps out, he's done interceding, he who is just will be just, and he who is unjust will be unjust. He's done. The seven last plagues begin. The seven last plagues during, are, through, are during this time, and then what? Jesus comes, okay? Is the organ. During the seven last plagues, right here, your hope cannot be in man. During National Sunday Law, which is this time, your hope cannot be in man. Friends, once that hits, there will, be, there will be no more pastoral counsel. Don't be looking for Pastor Charles. <laughs> Pastor Charles will be on his knees. As every single one of you should be. There will be no more churches. The Seventh-day Adventist organization will collapse, will be done. Because it is a law, a law to worship on Sunday. And a law against worshiping on Saturday, on Sabbath. But because there is no Seventh-day Adventist institution, organization, where there will still be God's faithful people, yes. His remnant, yes. the movement, of course, and during this time, during this time, we may not come to this beautiful building, but we'll be coming to each other's homes, places, caves, who knows where, meeting together, like-minded, worshiping God. And this is, this is a time of trouble right here as well. And during this time, before, what, what, what is this? Before the plagues fall. During this time, many of those who are outside will see and say, there is something right about here. And the Holy Spirit will convince them and they will join the flock. Amen. But unfortunately, friends, many fake Seventh-day Seventh Adventists will see this time of trouble come. What? I can't buy or sell? I can't handle that. You know what? I'm out. I'm out of here. And they give in because they need to buy and sell. They, they need to continue with their life the way they like it. And many, many of God's people will be shaken out. But praise the Lord, many will be shaken in. Amen. And once this hits right here, right here the seven last plagues friends you and I are gonna see as the Bible says there in Psalm 91 no plague will fall upon you but you will watch with your eyes you and I are gonna see really who is saved and who is not you know how right 
I mean, the first plague. What's the first plague? Sores. I mean, can you just imagine getting a phone call if phones are even still available or looking with people with sores? Maybe they're your friends. Maybe they're your family. Maybe they're your spouse. Friends, it will be a hard time of trouble, friends. I'm not going to paint it nice because Jesus doesn't paint it nice. It will be our time that we cannot depend on people at all. At all. And praise the Lord, praise the Lord, that after the seven lakhs plagues begin to fall, no more Christian martyrs. No more Christian martyrs. You know why, right? What is the purpose of God allowing a Christian martyr? To save someone. God allowed John the Baptist to reach Herod's heart. God allowed Stephen because it did reach Saul's heart who became Paul. And Saul became converted, and I'm sure others, because of Stephen's death testimonies. But once probation hits, no one can come in and no one can go out. There's no more Christian martyrs and God will protect his people during these plagues and during this time. And thank God because we, you and I, are not the devil's toys that he can kill whenever he wants. No. If God sees fit for you and I to be martyred during this time, friends, you have to put your faith in God and be okay with that. Amen. And just be confident that your death or your imprisonment brought somebody else to Jesus. Somebody else to God. But once these plagues begin and hit, God will protect his people. And this time will be short. And then, praise the Lord, Jesus will come. Amen. Jesus will come in the clouds. So during this time of trouble, friends, it's only going to be you and God. Only going to be you and God. Great Controversy, page 620, which, by the way, my favorite chapter, if you want to read my favorite chapter in Great Controversy, it's chapter 39. Time of trouble, 39. And if anyone here does not have the Great Controversy, please at the end see me and I will get you a free one. Today, those who delay a preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble. Why? It's too late. You got to prepare now. We have to prepare now. Okay? Those who delay a preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble or at any subsequent time. The case of all such is hopeless, friends. Oh, God forbid that that be any one of us here. But it depends on you. It depends on you. 625, continuing from the great controversy, to all the testing time will come. Everybody. By the sifting of temptations, the genuine Christian will be revealed. And the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they will not yield to the evidence of their senses. Notice the wording. They will not yield to what? Senses. Evidence of their senses. You see, their senses are going to tell them something else. Even today, our senses tell us something else. They, our senses sound like, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. Who cares what my senses say? What does the Bible say? Amen. What does the Bible say? Our senses, we, we will not yield to the evidence of our senses. The devil will even use our dead relatives to impersonate them. To believe that it's them who's come back to visit us. Our senses can fool us, friend. That's why we, God tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith in his word. What does the word of God say? 
would not yield to the evidence of their senses, would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible what? Only. only. It's only between you and God. It's only between you and God. You cannot cling to your spouse. You cannot cling to your children. That's why even Jesus says, if you love your father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. This is serious. It's only between you and God. Amen. Between you and God. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. Friends, during this time of trouble, during this time of trouble, and even during this time of trouble, our faith has to be solely on God. Solely, solely on God. And I want my closing text again just to be Psalms 91. Oh. Psalms 91. A thousand may fall at your right side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you will see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your habitations. Your habitations. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Amen. Amen. Verse 14, because he has set his love upon me, and therefore I will deliver him. Have, be confident that we set our love upon God, he will deliver us. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Amen, amen and amen. He has known my name. God will not abandon you, friends, as long as you do not abandon him. Deliverance through the plagues is about your relationship with God and his law. Now if you notice, we haven't even covered the seven last plagues. We're going to cover it next Sabbath. And we're going to see next Sabbath on how each single plague is a promise from God. Every single one of those plagues is a promise of God for you and me. It is, it, is, it, is, it is a judgment to the wicked, but it is a promise for us. It's a promise for us. But friends, it does, it does us no good to look at the seven last plagues and know all about them, but yet you have no relationship that when the plagues comes, you don't have that bond with Christ and you get the plagues. So God is dealing with you and me he is testing us. He is refining us. And he knows that if we are alive during this time, it's because he is counting on you and I to study more, read more, pray more, forgive more, and get a deeper relationship with God. Because he knows that that is the only way that we can make it during this time of trouble. And I want to thank the Lord God that this time the plagues yet have not happened. Because there are still friends and families that I am praying for. Amen. That, they, that they, by the will of God, even if it takes them for this to happen, for the National Sunday Law, even this time to come in. Coming into His relationship. Because once this happens, friends, it's too late. It's too late. And with all this in mind, friends, I want you to remember that Jesus does save. Our closing hymn is Jesus Saves. But Jesus saves not just during this time or even during that time, but He saves right now. Right now. And if there is anyone that has not given their heart to God, why is everyone going somewhere? The appeal is the time when we should be praying for those 
that need to be making a, con a, a decision for God. It's not time to pack up your stuff. If there is anyone here who has not surrendered their heart to God and would like to, anyone here who knows, you know, friends, I haven't even mentioned, but do you know what happens when we pass away? We're set. We're either already sealed or not. There is no second chance after we pass away. So when should we be ready and when should we accept God? Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Right now. Even us young people do not have our years guaranteed. I can die tomorrow or I can die next week. Or I can die this afternoon. That's why it's important that right now we give our hearts to God. And if there is anyone who has not given their hearts to God, I appeal to you to give it and surrender it all to Him. And always know that Jesus does save. He saves during this time of trouble, during this time of trouble, and even right now. Even right now. I want to pray and and appeal that if there is anyone who needs to make that decision to follow Jesus all the way, that while we sing, while we have our closing hymn, if you'd like to come to the front and I can get your name and information or give it to Pastor Austin or myself, please come. Or you can meet us at the door as well. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time, friends. Father in heaven, Lord, you know the hearts that are, have been procrastinating in giving themselves to you. Lord, forgive me if there's anything that I said or done that displeases you. But Lord, the times are coming in which will be very terrible. But if we have fixed our faith in you, our trust in you, we are looking forward to those times. Because we know that once affliction comes, deliverance is next. And so my God, I just want to ask and pray for anyone here who is still maybe on the fence to get off that fence and come to you. And come to you because you save. Thank you, Father God, for your saving power from the enemy. I ask for every single member here that you may inflict every single one to have a deeper relationship with you, a deeper connection. Because once the time of trouble begins, Lord, we know that it will just be between you and us. And so let that begin now. Bless your church here in Cleburne. Bless your church around the world. Bless your church people. Even those that are outside but that will come inside. I thank you, my God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.